Hello everyone, uh, welcome back. Today we are going to be doing physics, um, IGCSE paper 2-1. This is the variant one, and this is the May June 2022 paper. Um, okay, so let's get started. Now remember one thing about the 2023 is that you cannot use this one, this is wrong. Um, you cannot, you ha this year you have to take the weight of one kilogram to be 9.8. Um, because in recently in the syllabus changes, they have changed it to 9.8 um, for the G value as well. So please keep that in mind as you do all of these calculations. Okay, question number one. Which measuring devices are most suitable for determining the length of the swimming pool and the thickness of aluminum foil? Well, to determine the length of a swimming pool, you have to use something called a tape measure. And to use the thickness, um, to measure the thickness of aluminum foil, you have to use something called a micrometer screw gauge. Because as you know, aluminum foil is just like paper. It is really thin and we are measuring its thickness or width. And therefore it has to be really, really small. And the mic micrometer screw gauge can measure up to the millimeter. So B is the correct answer. Question number two. A man stands next to a railroad track. Okay, there's the man. A train is traveling at 40 meters per second, and it takes two seconds to pass the man. Now, what has been given? So we have been given with the speed, and we have been given with the time. And the question asks you, what is the length of the train? So remember, the length is basically the distance. Now, don't overthink this too much. It's basically using the speed formula, which is speed is equal to distance divided by time. And this time, they are asking for length, so distance is equal to speed times time. And the speed here is 40 meters per second. There's two seconds, and therefore we will get 80 meters. And therefore, the length of the train is 80 meters. Okay, so it is 80 meters. So um, D is the correct answer. Question number three. A speed time graph is used to describe motion of an object, which quantities are calculated from the gradient of the graph and from the area under the graph. Remember the gradient of a graph of a speed time graph. Speed time graph is that the gradient is going to be the gradient is going to be the acceleration, and the area under the graph, uh, in this case this one, is going to be the distance traveled, and therefore A is the correct answer. Question number four: On the moon, all objects fall with the same acceleration. Which statement explains this? Well, this is because. The weight of an object is directly proportional to its mass. Remember, use the formula W is equal to mg. And this tells us that W is directly proportional to m. So if the mass increases, the weight is going to increase. But the gravitational uh, field strength will still, con will still constant. And therefore, if the mass increases, the weight also increases. And therefore, it is directly proportional. Thus, C is the correct answer. Question number five, a measuring cylinder contains 30 cm cube of a liquid. Okay, and we can see that there is a 30 um, cm cube here. Um, okay, some more of the liquid is added until the liquid level reaches the 50 cm cube mark. So um, the liquid is added until it reaches the 50 cm, which is this, this point. And the reading on the balance increased by 30 grams. So what we know here is that we add we add around 20 cm cube of the liquid, and then the balance increases by 30 grams. Now it wants us to find the density. So we have gotten the volume, we have gotten the mass. So density, remember, is density is equal to mass over volume. Or you can just remember drunk, um, drunk man vomit uh, by this acronym. It's a really fun acronym. <laughs> and so let's use this formula. Uh, the mass is 30 grams, uh, the volume is 20, and this will give us, this will give us 1.5 grams per cm cube, and therefore C is the correct answer. Okay, um, question number six, an object on the end of a string moves in a clockwise circular path. Remember, circular path, so this is the question that is likely about circular motion. Um, okay, at constant speed, but remember the velocity uh, the velocity is always changing and since the velocity is always changing that it is also accelerating and this is something that many people get it wrong. I'm going off topic here, but this is something to note. 
The diagram shows the object as viewed from above. What is the direction of the resultant force on the object when it is in the position shown, okay? The resultant force will always be inwards. The resultant force will always act inwards. Um, this, is, uh, this applies to the circular objects that are moving in the circular motion. Um, it acts inwards, and in this case, the force that is giving this uh, centripetal force is called tension. And this tension is the force that gives the centripetal force. And therefore, it is the correct answer. Question number seven. A beam is pivoted at one end as shown. The beam weighs six newtons and its weight acts at a point 40 centimeter from the pivot. A force of four newton is applied to the beam, causing it to balance horizontally. In which direction and where is the four newton force applied? And look at the six newtons and the four newtons. Which which one is a bigger force? Six newtons is a big force. Since six newtons is a bigger force, we know that uh, moment. Remember, moment is equal to force times perpendicular distance, and therefore, and therefore, um, it all depends on the distance. For example, um, so if the distance is less. The force is more so like the distance and force are inverse inversely proportional if the distance is um, very far away from the pivot then the, there you need less force and therefore uh, a lower moment okay so since the four newtons uh, six and four newton is smaller than the six newton it has to be the distance has to be longer or further away from the pivot and therefore it has to be and then it is saying that it is balancing horizontally. It just means that it is in equilibrium. If it's in equilibrium, then it must, since the weight is acting downwards, um, the moment or this four newton force has to apply it upwards. So we know it has to apply vertically upwards and it has to be longer than the 40 distance. So it has to be 20 cm on the right, on the right. So it is going to be, the distance is going to increase. Therefore, this is the correct answer. Question number eight, and on the diagram, what is the magnitude of the resulting force of these two vectors? Now remember, there are two ways to do this, but I would like to show you the most easiest way possible. You could use the parallelogram method, and you could measure this distance uh, if you have a ruler, and then work out with the scale. But since I do not have that, I'm going to use the uh, Pythagoras method, which is um, to move this to the side. So it's going to be like this. Okay, the six newton is going to be here, and therefore we have to from the tip, from the end of the tip to tail. This is how we work out. Usually, we work out that it's a, it's called the tip to tail method. Um, tip to tail method, and okay, so here we can use the Pythagoras method, which is six, and we want to buy the hypotenuse. So, um, using the a square is equal to b square plus c square. So we can find the equation. So this is 8 squared plus 6 squared over the square root. This is going to give us 10. So C is the correct answer. Question number 9. Three situations are listed. An object has a resultant force acting on it. An object experiences an impulse. An object is decelerating. In which situation is the momentum of the object changing? Remember, momentum is represented by small p and it is equal to mass times velocity. Now, it says that a uh, resultant force is acting on it. It is true because remember force is equal to change in momentum over time. You have to remember the formulas as well to get this right. Uh, force is equal to moment, uh, change in momentum over time. And therefore, if, if the momentum is changing or increasing or decreasing, the force will also increase or decrease um, corresponding to the change in momentum. And therefore, number one is correct. An object moving experiences an impulse. Remember, impulse is basically a change in momentum or force multiplied time. Uh, this is equal to change in momentum. So if the momentum is also changing or increasing or decreasing, then the impulse will also increase or decrease respectively. And therefore, two is also correct. An object is decelerating. Okay, for this one, um, it is also experiencing momentum because the velocity is changing, the speed is changing, and therefore, um, the momentum will 
also will change, and therefore 1, 2, 3 are correct. So D is the correct answer. Question number 10. A ball of the mass 0.16 kilograms is moving forward with a speed of 0.5 meters per second. A second ball of a mass 0.1 zero kilograms is stationary. Remember when it's stationary the speed is always equal to zero. Um, the first ball strikes the second ball. The second ball moves forward at a speed of 0 0.50 meters per second. What is the speed of the first ball after the collision? Remember there are two cases of momentum in IGCSE level. Um, there is the one of the momentum where a ball strikes the other and then they will move together in the same direction or they will be in the opposite direction and bump into each other, they'll collide to each other. Or the other one is that one of the ball, the ball, two of them will move together, uh, but at different speeds. Okay, so what is the speed of the first ball? Uh, so remember, we have to remember a very important principle here, which is the momentum before, the total momentum before has to equal to the total momentum afterwards. And so by using this principle, you can solve this whole um, uh, word problem. So here, so this is the mass and the velocity. So which is, this is ball A, the second ball, let's give it ball B. So 0 0.16 multiplied 0 0.50. And it's going to, this is the total momentum before. It's going to equal to the second ball, um, which is moving at a speed of 0 0.5. So 0 0.10 times 0 0.50 plus, because there's also the first ball, uh, we don't know the speed of the first ball, but we know the mass. So we can write 0 0.16 V. And we have to find this V. We just have to substitute it and find the V. So V is going to equal to, the V is going to be equal to 0 0.50 meters per second. And therefore, V is the Zero point one nine seconds. Sorry, my calculation was wrong. Okay, the v is going to equal to zero point one nine meters per second, and therefore b is the correct answer. Okay, question number eleven: A mass hangs vertically from a spring. The mass is raised to point p, and then it is released. The mass oscillates. Remember, oscillates. Okay, repeatedly between point b and the world point q. Which energies alternately increase and decrease throughout the oscillation? Remember, oscillating means they're bouncing up and down. And remember, this mass is highly likely to be a ball. And if there are oscillations, then there, may, there is an elastic energy. Elastic energy. And so there is also a change in gravitational potential energy because there is the lower point and the higher point P. And then there's also, since there's GPE, the GPE is going to turn into KE, which is going to turn into elastic energy. So A is the correct answer. Okay, question number 12. A car has 620 kilojoules of kinetic energy. Now this energy, the car breaks and stops in a distance of 91 meters. 91 meters it is the distance. What is the average braking force of acting on the car? So now we get the energy and the distance. Um, so we want to know the force. So force, remember we have to know the work done formula. First of all, the work done is equal to force times distance. And if we want to find the force, we just have to rearrange it, which is force is equal to work done over distance. And work done really is just energy. And therefore the energy is six, 20 kilojoules which is 620,000 joules and then the distance is 91 meter and if we divide them we are going to get 6,813 or which is equal to 6,800 uh, newtons so C is the correct answer. Question 13. The diagram shows a deep reservoir formed by a dam. On what does the pressure at x depend on? So the pressure of x is under water, it is below the water, it has a height below. So this means uh, the pressure in liquids or in underwater is dependent mainly on the height or the depth of the water at x. So A is the correct answer. Question number 14. A sealed rigid container has fixed volume. The container is filled with air. The container is in the freezer cabinet and the temperature of the air in the container decreases 
which rules correctly describes what happens to the air in the container. The average distance between air particles are going to be, uh, it, it will not change, but the average speed of the air particles will, however, decrease because it is placed in the freezer and therefore the temperature also decreases. If temperature decreases, the kinetic energy decreases, which means the speed also decreases. And therefore, C is the correct answer. Question 15. Two open containers are filled with water at room temperature. The containers have different shapes. Container 1, container 2. From which container does the water evaporate at a greater rate and how does the rate of evaporation can be increased? Remember, there are so many factors that play uh, on evaporation. There is the fan speed um, that plays a role on the rate of e evaporation. And there is also the surface area, which is very important. So the larger the surface area, the greater the rate of evaporation. So obviously, the container 1, we can see it has more surface area. Uh, than container 2 and therefore the rate of evaporation will be greater in container 1. How can the rate of evaporation, evaporation can be increased? Remember there's also another factor called temperature. If you increase the temperature, the rate of evaporation will also increase. So we can increase the water temperature, so B is the correct answer. Question 16. The diagram shows a liquid in glass thermometer. The student wishes to check the markings of the upper fixed point of this thermometer. What should she do? Well, if you want to know the upper fixed point, the upper fixed point is basically this 100 degrees Celsius or the boiling point. Uh, it is known as the boiling point. Um, I think some of the books also stay, say steam point. And it, if you want the steam point, you have to put the bulb inside a beaker of pure boiling water. And therefore, B is the current answer. Question 17. Water in a beaker gains thermal energy. Okay. Okay, so this question is actually not in the syllabus anymore because they removed the specific latent heat topic in the thermophysics, so we don't have to focus on this question. Question number 18. A glass contains an ice drink on a warm and humid day. Water starts to form outside of the glass. What is the name of the effect by which the water forms? Um, so the water cools, the water cools, and if the water cools, this is called condensation, and therefore... A is the correct answer. Question 19. One end of the copper bar is heated to a high temperature. Which me mechanism is responsible for the transfer of thermal energy to the other end of the copper bar? Remember, there are two mechanisms in play because copper is a metal. One, one of which is the atoms or, or the ions of copper, and uh, the vibration of the copper ions, and the other is the movement of the energy of the electrons. So therefore, the lattice vibration of copper ions and with, together with the movement of the high energy electrons, they will transfer the energy. And this is called thermal conduction. And therefore, B is the correct answer. Question 20. The diagram shows a convection current caused by a piece of ice placed in a beaker of water at room temperature, which rows correctly to compare the temperature and density at points P and Q. Okay. Uh, so at temperature at P, remember the ice water, this is convection, convection. And in convection, the at point P is where the cold air lays because they are denser, they're very dense. And at Q, it is high up because it is less dense. And because they are heated as well, they are, the, the temperature there is higher. Uh, the temperature at P is cold and therefore the temperature is lower. So the temperature at P is going to be lower than at Q and the density at P is going to be higher because colder, denser, meaning they will sink to the bottom and therefore 20 is C. Okay. Okay, I'm moving on to question 21. The diagram shows a wave. Which row is correct? Now remember, the amplitude of the wave is basically the point from which it is undisturbed uh, from its maximum displacement. So the undisturbed position is basically this axis line. You can see this x-axis, and that is its um, undisturbed position. Undisturbed position. And so that is basically um, from the maximum displacement from here to here, basically how high it is, 
and therefore it is one, one centimeters. Um, for the wavelength, the wavelength is basically um, one oscillation. So basically, if we can go from here to here, this is one wave. Um, it could also be from one trout to another trout. This is also one wave. Um, it could be anywhere as long as the position that starts and ends are the same. Uh, you can call it a wavelength. So in this case, um, eight to sixteen, which is eight centimeters. Therefore, B is the correct answer. Question 22. A sound wave is created by a loudspeaker that vibrates backwards and forwards 9,600 times per minute. The speed of sound is 360 meters per second. Notice that the units are different, so we will have to convert one of them into uh, the same units. What is the wave in the sound wave? Well, remember, this is basically uh, speed is equal to, uh, it is basically the wave speed. Uh, we have to use the wave speed formula, which is V is equal to F lambda. Uh, lambda is basically the wavelength, so we have to rearrange the equation, which is lambda is equal to speed divided by frequency. Now, it has given us the frequency here, which is 96,000 uh, 96, times per minute. But the 96,000 times per minute has to be reduced um, we, we have to divide by 60 to turn it into um, per second and therefore we get the answer of 1600 times per second and so we are going to divide the speed which is through the 320 divided by 1600 now this is going to give us 0 0.20 meters and therefore it is the correct answer Question 23, a card is placed in front of a plane mirror, so its label is based on the plane mirror. As shown, the label is shown, okay. What, how does the image of the label formed by the mirror appear to the observer? Remember when you put in a mirror or a plane mirror, uh, the reflected image is always laterally inverted. Laterally inverted. Remember, so what, the, what do I mean by this laterally inverted? Laterally meaning it will only change from right to left or left to right. Um, if you put it in this right direction, it's going to put it in the wrong, in the left direction. And if you put the object in the left direction, the image shown on the mirror is going to be in the right direction. So they're only going to change right and left. They won't change, they will not be reflected um, up and down. This is what the word naturally means. And therefore, you see this one, um, this is so this is going to just get reflected um, left and right. So it is going to be I and this is going to be C. Therefore, C is the correct answer. Question 24. A thin converging lens can produce both a real and virtual image, which will describe a real and virtual image. In a real image, the rays will converge together to form the image. However, in a virtual image, image cannot be projected into onto a screen. And that is something that you will have to learn by heart. Question 25. The speed of light in air is 3 multiplied 10 to the power 8 meters per second. This is the speed. The critical angle for light in transparent plastic material is uh, 37 degrees, so this is given as the C. Or the critical angle, what is the speed of light in the plastic material? Now this is a two-step process. Remember the formula N is equal to 1 over sine C. We have to first find the, the refractive index. So. 1 over sine 37, this is going to give us 1.66 and 1.66. Okay, so remember uh, another formula of the refractive index, it is the ratio of the speed of light in air or the in, in the vacuum uh, divided by the speed of light in the medium. In this case, the medium is the plastic material. So the speed of light in air is 3, um, so if we rearrange the equation, um, it's going to be speed of light which is 3 multiplied 10 to the power 8, and the refractive index which is 1.66, if we divide them like that, we will get 1.8 multiplied 10 to the power 8 meters per second, and therefore A is the correct answer. Question 26, which part of the electromagnetic spectrum is used by a remote controller for television? In television, we use um, the inf infrared spectrum part, and therefore, it is the correct answer. 
Uh, now, do you notice that you have to know all the uses and consequences of this electromagnetic spectrum and each wave and their uses in the real world um, that is required in the syllabus? Question 27. Which statement compares radio waves and x-rays? Remember, you have to learn the, the full part, which is the radio waves, microwaves, and then infrared rays, visible light, and then ultraviolet, and then x-rays, and then gamma rays. You have to learn this. Uh, this process is probably an acronym for it, but I just remember them like that. And so, radio waves has very long wavelength, and the x-rays have short wavelength. However, their frequency is increased. Okay, so radios have longer wavelength. This is correct. And they have the same speed in a vacuum. Remember, all electromagnetic uh, waves travel at a constant 3 multiplied 10 to the power 8 inside a vacuum. And therefore, B is correct. That is 28. The student counts how many iron pins an electromagnet picks up when the power supply is switched on. Then she counts how many pins are picked up when the power supply is switched off. Okay, so this is... Okay, she repeats the experiment using a core made of different materials. The results are shown. What, which core is made out of soft iron? Remember, soft iron is a soft um, magnetic material material and therefore it is easy to magnetize as well as it is easy to demagnetize as well so it will not uh, hold on to its magnetism for a really long time unlike its permanent permanent magnet counterpart now let's see the pins picked up with the power supply on okay we can see that it could not be zero it could not be two it is easily magnetized so it could pick up lots of um uh, iron pins, so it could be 12 and 8. However, when we look at this pins picked off when the power supply is off, when you turn off the power supply or when you turn off this electromagnet, the iron pins, they immediately lose all of their magnetism and they will not retain it. And therefore, zero pins are picked up when the power supply is off. So D is the correct answer. Question 29. A plastic rod is brought to a near plastic, small plastic spear suspended from a stand. The spear is repelled by the rod. Why is this? Well, this is because they have light charges. So it could be that they both have positive charges. It could be both that they have negatively charged. And therefore, these these objects will re repel each other and, it is, and they will move away from each other. And therefore, it is the correct answer. Question 30. Which unit is equivalent to volt? So this is basically asking your knowledge about whether you know the formula of volt. Do you really understand what a volt means? So recall the equation volt is equal to energy over charge. So it is the amount of energy that is needed to push a charge around a circuit. Um, and therefore, it is a uh, remember energy unit is joules and charge unit is coulomb. And therefore, 1 volt is equal to 1 joule per coulomb. And therefore, P is the correct answer. Question 31. A resistor converts 360 joules of energy when there is a three current of 3 amperes in it. The potential difference across the resistor is 6 volts. How long is the current in the resistor? Now, this also is a two-step process, and then you have to use many formulas. So first of all, we have to know what it is asking. It is asking for the time. So remember, voltage is equal to energy over current, over, over voltage is energy over coulomb or charge. I'm sorry, I messed up. So and then Q is equal to E over V if we rearrange it. Now we know that the Q is equal to i t this is the formula and then we know we want to find the t basically the t is equal to q over i and so we know that the energy here is going to be 360 because they have given us 360 joules and the volt here is 6 volts and this is going to give us 60 um 60 coulomb now the, they also given us the current so time is equal to 60 Coulomb divided by 3 amperes. This will give us a total of 20 seconds. And therefore, B is the correct answer.
Question 32. The four circuits are shown to contain four diodes, in which a circuit is the direction of the current in the resistor always from the red to the black. Okay, for this one, it's a little bit tricky, but, you know, it's mostly uh, easy to do. Um, so here, remember, the diode symbol looks like this, and this is the positive side, and the, the one with the long stick is the negative, negative charge. So it'll always go from positive to negative, so we can look at this from here. So it's going to go from like this, it's going to go like this, it's going to go like this, so it will go from red to black, and then it's going to go back from red to black again, and therefore, if you can see the pattern there, uh, it's going to go from red to black as always. Um, therefore, we and therefore it is the correct answer. Now, if you don't know about this, uh, there's a pretty um coincidence um with these IGCSE papers is that most of the hard questions, the harder one, the longer questions, most of the answers are. Um, in the A option, um, I don't know if it is just by chance, but most of the past paper that I have done, always the hardest one, they always contain as A. So maybe just a tip for you guys in case you forgot or don't know how to do the question. Just choose the option A. <laughs> okay, question 33. The diagram shows a circuit of six identical lamps connected to a battery. Which lamps are the brightest? Also, this also seems like a very hard question, so probably A is the answer, but let's figure it out. Okay, it says six identical lamps, so the, the resistance is constant. Okay, so the battery, remember in a series, P is connected to series with, this parallel, with other two parallel circuits. And so we can say that um, in series, remember the voltage is shared voltage is shared on um, the EMF or the supply voltage the supply voltage supply voltage is shared among the three that are connected in series but in parallel however in parallel the voltage is the same as the EMF or the supply okay so in parallel it is the same as the EMF or the supply. Uh, to help you better understand this, I'm going to give you an example. And let, let's say that the battery has uh, 9 volts. Now, this 9 volts is going to be shared across in series. In series. Um, so each of them, because they're identical, each of them are going to get 3 volts. This is going to get 3 volts. This is also going to get 3 volts. But remember, Q and R are in parallel. And they both will have three volts. R is going to have three volts as well. S is going to have three volts. Um, uh, T is going to have three volts. U is going to have three volts. Remember, it's now because the current is split off in Q and R and S T U. Um, the P one, which is the current, is not split off, and therefore the P one will be the most brightest. Although all the voltages are the same, the current are not the same because um, because of the because the current is split off in Q and R in STU, the current is not split off. And so the current also depends on the brightness, not only the voltage. So in this case, the voltage is constant, but the current is not. And therefore, P is the brightest. So A is the current answer. Okay. Question 34, okay, we can definitely skip this when we see this because this is the logic gate question. And remember, starting from 2023 and onwards, um, the physics syllabus, they have removed everything concerning about logic gates and there is no more ele um, electron guns um, or the um, cathode ray tube and there are no such things like that anymore. But however, they added a new topic called space physics and this is the one to make up for all the content that is removed. Um, so we can skip this question because it is no importance of our syllabus requirements. A magnet is dropped vertically through a solenoid. This induces ma magnetic poles in both ends of the solenoid. Okay. Um, which magnet poles are induced at position X in diagram 1 and 3? 
Okay, in diagram one, remember when the magnet, okay, so when the magnet goes in, it is moving towards the solenoid. It is going to make this into a magnetic field. This is going to become a magnet. It's going to induce it for it to be a magnet. And the magnetic field that is produced by the solenoid is going to oppose the direction, oppose the direction. So when the south pole is going inwards, there's going to be a south pole at the the other end so that they will repel in other words it opposes the direction of the movement the same as well goes from here when it goes out and this is not then it's going to attract back again because if it goes out you're going to go in if it's go in it's going to let you go out and so this is what is known as lens law it opposes the direction of motion and in here so if it goes, if it wants to attract again, this place should be south as well. And therefore, the diagram 1 has to be south, the diagram 3 also has to be south. And therefore, and therefore, A is the correct answer. Uh, sorry, this is 35. Uh, so so C is the correct answer because this has to be the south pole and when it's moving out it has to Okay, I'm sorry here, um, I have made you guys confused. It says at the position X, I was looking at the position at this position, so I was totally wrong about that. Okay, so if it's going out, north is going to attract, it was going to let you attract inwards. So this is going to be south. If this is south, the upward at, at the position X is going to be north. So it's going to be north. Sorry, I didn't look at the diagram um, as well because uh, it says position X, not this, not the position here, and therefore C is the correct answer. Um, question 36, which transformers can change 240 AC into 15 volt AC output? So this is all about ratio, ratio, ratio. Remember the transformer equation, it is just basically the primary turns ratio over the primary and the secondary turns. And then the volt primary voltage over secondary voltage. Okay, so here it is definite since the up secondary output is going to be lower than the primary output, we can see that this is a step down transformer. And so we just have to find the ratio. If you've given us this ratio, this ratio has to be equal, the number of turns ratio has to be equal to the voltage. And so we just have to divide this by this, this by this, this by this, and this by this. And so I've done the math for you. This is going to be D, and which is 1,200 divided by 75 is going to equal to 16. And 240 volts divided by 15 is also going to be 16, and therefore D is the correct answer. Okay, question 37. What is the purpose? of the split ring commutator in the electric motor. Well, in the electric motor, it is to ensure that the turning effect, remember, on the motor stays the same at all directions. So it will only be continuously turning clockwise or anti-clockwise. Uh, it doesn't want you to turn halfway anti-clockwise and halfway clockwise direction. So it would become like an AC. Uh, but we want to ensure so that the turning effect on the motor stays at the same direction as all time. So D is the correct answer. Question 38. How do the sizes of two nuclei pro produced in nuclear fission reaction compare to the size of the original nucleus? Remember the size of the two nuclei produced in nuclear fission, which means uh, they both have to be smaller than the original nucleus. And therefore, C is the correct answer. Question 39, which statement about the radioactive decay of the substance is correct? Remember, radioactive decay is random and it's a random process, and therefore, it is uh, you cannot predict when a 
perpendicular nucleus will decay, and therefore A is the correct answer. Question 40. Okay, the diagram shows a stream of beta particles traveling in line that passes through the poles of a magnet. In which direction will the beta particles be deflected by the magnet? Now remember, we have to use a direction that is axing for the motion of the force. The force. And therefore, we have to use uh, Fleming's left hand rule. Left hand rule to figure this out. So we have to figure out the force direction. The force direction is the thumb. Um, the the first finger or your index finger um, is going to be the magnetic field and your second finger or your third finger if you would like to call it is going to be the direction of alpha particles because alpha particles is basically current and a current goes from positive to negative and so what is the opposite of the alpha alpha current it is the beta particle and therefore you have for this question it's easier to do the alpha particle find the alpha particles force and motion and then the opposite of the force and motion is the beta particles force and motion and therefore if you do it if you put your hand out in the direction as shown um, you are going to get the the force of the direction is going to be into h and therefore c is the correct answer Therefore, C is the correct answer. Now we have reached the end of the video. I hope you have no questions. Or uh, if you have questions, please do leave them in the comments below. And thank you for watching. As always, I'll see you in the next video.